It's an honor to have him to kick off our, our 2019 year. Uh, I can't actually talk more about what happens in post-GIS, so I'll just let him actually uh, lead us through this with our uh, goal of some folks here might not know how to spell post-GIS, so always help to orient them and then take us deep into all of this. Thank you, Paul. Here we go. Um, so I talk about post um, an open source software to a lot of different folks, and the problem I constantly run up against is putting together material it's, it's the great unknown of who is in the audience, right? And what are they interested in? And, and even if I can figure that out, how to fit the necessary material into the time allotted, which in this case is very, very little. Um, so yeah, it's a problem, problems of audience and duration. It's, it's a hard one. So for this audience, which, which I assume is full of people who have mostly heard of Postgis, but, but maybe not used it, um, but understand geospatial, I'd like to concentrate on a couple of key points. Um, and the leaping off, for the first point I take uh, from the late Senator Ted Stevens, who in 2006 oh, no, explained no, no. to a baffled Senate committee audience that, that the internet, as he understood it, was a series of tubes. <laughs> <laughs> and and this, for this fairly advanced insight, he was treated to several years of ridicule. <laughs> um, because Stevens didn't say the internet was something available on Windows, or the internet was a web browser, or the internet was you know some other thing that presented itself to him as colorful pixels on a screen. You know, Stevens, he clearly didn't use the internet, um, but that maybe helped him to intuit an understanding, right, that the true internet lived below the surface, um, that it was infrastructure for moving information around, that for routing it from place to place, and that the proper metaphor was not commerce or entertainment or art or games, but but plumbing. You know, unseen important connections behind the walls and under our feet. You know, the internet, as I understand it, is a series of tubes. <laughs> um, so what about our own little field, right? Um, what's a useful metaphor for understanding GIS? Or to use a phrase which I initially despised, coming around to, over time, understand the practice of geospatial intelligence. Um, what's a core metaphor? for our profession. And it's pretty hard to argue the core metaphor has been the and remains dumb app and the tool we cannot help reaching for as practitioners is and remains the desktop computer analog to the map, which is the GIS software. And when I talk about open source uh, geospatial, the audiences at like regional GIS conferences, I can talk myself blue in the face about open source libraries and databases and scripting, but I don't really light up um, until I tried out QGIS, uh, the open source desktop GIS. Aha! Ha! Huh, like I say, I see the value in open source now. That's it. That's, that's the metaphor. Um, and yet, I feel like they're leaving an awful lot on the table. Like they're bounding their understanding of our profession that way. Like you can do a lot with a desktop GIS, and under the covers, there's a series of tubes in there. But just as you'd be leery about hiring a plumber who didn't like cutting pipe, uh, I think that employers should think twice before employing geospatial experts who don't actually know how the geospatial pipes work. Because our work is also a series of tubes, right? <laughs> Running from raw sensor data, you know, observations through corrections and rectification and feature extraction and classification and storage and query and analysis and rendering user reaction. It's a series of tubes. So uh, if you want to start working with the geospatial pipes, there's two skills I think everyone should, everyone should learn. You know, Python or some other scripting language and SQL. Plumbing. The language of databases. <laughs> Plumbing is good if you want to work with water. <laughs> um, but for geospatial data, scripting language and SQL. And here some people might part ways with me and assert that Python alone is enough. They sure say, sure, databases are important as an architectural component, but really they're just a standardized backing store um, that allow me to hook up all my apps and scripts to get all the interesting stuff. Um, that should be done in scripts and programs. But spatial SQL in Postgres and PostGIS has some important advantages over scripts. Now, SQL runs right next to the data at native speed. There's no network transport to traverse, no extra step of serializing, sending the data over the wire to serializing. Like one of the reasons SQL in databases often test out as fast as the desktop GIS is just because they have the advantage of being near the storage layer. And in SQL, the execution logic is figured out at runtime by the database engine. So you get the most efficient execution plan automatically. You don't have to figure it out manually. Like with modern Postgres these days, that includes things like parallel execution plans, which you just get for free. You know, there's no special multi-threaded programming required to do that. It just figures it out for you. That's the most efficient thing to do. Now, one of the curious benefits of being an older language is that SQL is not 
as much a moving target as other languages. You can learn SQL now, and your knowledge is, well, is going to be not going to be out of date in four years. Like that's that's really nice. It's also knowledge you can probably take between systems. You know, from Postgres to SQL Server to Oracle, it's a career investment that doesn't stop paying off. And that brings me to point number two I want to convey tonight, which just is just how much stuff you can do with spatial SQL and PostGIS. Because when you have access to a spatial database like PostGIS, you have access to a GIS without the GIS. If you're just using your database as a backing store, as a place to store data and retrieve bounding box queries, you are leaving 98% of the functionality on the table. Um, so, <laughs> ready? <laughs> I'm going to start talking even faster. Um, this list is by no means exhaustive, um, but in full it can be exhausting, so I've picked off some things that I consider interesting. Um, GIS questions. What parcels are within a kilometer of the fire? Can you answer this with SQL? Sure you can. It doesn't even take very much SQL. That's where you get the answer. GIS questions. How far did the bus travel last week? Easy peasy. It's only four lines of SQL. What happens when you have multiple tables? Can you put them together using spatial predicates? Of course you can. Is that useful? It's immensely useful. Suppose you had millions and millions of customers in your point of sale database. You know they like to buy Red Sox. What if you want to know what the socioeconomic distribution of people who like to buy Red Sox is? You can't get that out of the point of sale database. But there is an organization that provides that information. The US Census. What if you had socioeconomic and we have point of sale data. Can you put those things together? Yes, you can. And again, it does not take very much SQL to do it. That's how much it takes to put your census data together with your point of sale data and roll up the census information for all your customers. And tell you, so you can tell you that only rich people buy red socks. <laughs> <laughs> if you have your data in PostGIS, are you stuck in a particular projection? No, you're not. PostGIS supports every projection in the EPSG database. That's not many you say. It's an awful lot. <laughs> There's more coming. There's more coming, yes. Um, if you're a highways or transportation person or a fisheries biologist, you want to do linear referencing, can you do linear referencing? Yes, you can. There's a lot of functions that support it. So linear referencing allows you to add a measure to all your objects, which then you can use to interpolate other things. These days, what people use measure for is actually, instead of M, you stick time in there. So you have X, Y, and T coordinates, and we also have functions that understand the idea of trajectories. So you can do things like find the point where two trajectories came closest. This is great if you're like, doing air traffic control or really anything else that moves. <laughs> uh, if you're using 3D coordinates, which lots of people do, we have a whole suite of functions that allow you to do um, calculations that understand the data is in the three-dimensional domain. So you can do 3D distance, um, 3D length. The, uh, the version of the function is up the 3D, just do it in the 2D plane for you. Uh, we do support ISO curves, uh, which means necessarily we allow you to convert the curves to stroked objects, uh, line strings for systems that don't understand curves. Uh, once you've stroked your objects, we let you turn the back into curves, because that's the first thing you do. You say, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I want to turn the back. Um, lots of basic constructive geometry functions. You know, geometry is an input, modified geometry is an output. So the classic, the GIS favorite, the buffer, but also intersections, difference, symmetric distance, difference, unions. Um, picture of a buffer. All GIS people know what a buffer is. It's surprising how many non-GIS people go, what the heck is that? What do you mean buffer? <laughs> um, so here's your classic buffer. Given a geometry and a radius, make something which is bigger, you know, blow up the balloon. Postgres understands the idea of a negative buffer as well. Feed it a negative radius and it gets smaller. Feed it a big enough ne negative radius and it just goes away. Um, unions. Databases have the concept of an aggregate function, take multiple values and, melt and give you a single aggregate. We have the idea of an aggregate geometry function. So ST union will take in sets of geometry and melt them together. So in this case, melting all the counties in the country down into the states by grouping by the state code. A um, whole bunch of functions for building up geometries. Given, say, a uh, set of GPS coordinates, can you build them into a line? Sure, as long as you provide them in the right order, we can build them into a line. Presumably you collected them in time-based order. Given that line, convert it into a polygon with a build area function, no problem. Um, PostGIS is built uh, to use a whole bunch of underlying libraries for most of its functionality. So you load PostGIS into Postgres, um, PostGIS itself links a bunch of other libraries. Standard computational geometry from GIOS, standard projections from LibProj, things like XML handling for uh, GML and KML and LibXML. Um, and we also allow you to optionally add other linking libraries. Seagull is one of those. Uh, Seagull is a computational geometry algorithms library. Woo! Another library. 
it gives us um, sort of crazy algorithmic stuff that's not available in the in other libraries. So, 3D intersection that does volumetric intersections between um, solids. 3D area and union, same thing. Solid geometry. Yes. Some wonderful stuff for uh, taking polygons and converting them into lines, like straight skeletons and medial axes. What's a medial axis, you ask? That's what a medial axis is. <laughs> Convert a polygon into a line. Um, for those of you who are flying satellites, who here owns a satellite? Me. There you go, several Woo! satellite owners. Oh, I don't actually own any satellites. <laughs> <laughs> um, inevitably, your satellite will fly over the poles. This can make things really, really hard if you're working in a planar projection. If your data is going over the poles, it's going over the date line, you need a, you need a data, data type which understands the idea of spherical geometry. The geography type is one that, uh, stand, that understands that. And I like the idea of spherical geometry actually has a fancy math name for it. It's called S2 uh, to distinguish it from things like R2 and R3, standard uh, Cartesian systems. So in S2, in S2, all, all, all edges between two points are great circles as opposed to the Cartesian model where all edges between two points are straight lines. Uh, things you can do in geography, the indexes know that you're on a sphere, so it doesn't matter if you go over the pole, it doesn't matter if you go over the date line. Um, it'll do nearest neighbor searches indexed, again, it doesn't matter if you're over the poles, over the date line. Uh, native implementations of intersects, distance, be within an area, these understand and work on the spheroids that give you exact results uh, based on whatever spheroid you care to handle it, hand it, by default WGS84, but you can choose your own. And for all the other functions which have non-native implementations, you can cast back to the standard planar type and do your work there. Uh, we do have a raster type which allows you to take um, gridded data and store it in the database and work with it. This is the important part, that you can work with it. Storing it, boring, working with it, totally cool. Uh, raster vector analyses, so you have vector tables, you have raster tables, take the vectors, overlay them on the rasters, generate a mask, apply the masks doing uh, math algebra on your, on your rasters, summarize the final result. You can think of things like, say, um, for this area, tell me the probability of precipitation or the average uh, slope, that kind of stuff. Uh, we do have a topology model for folks who are handling administrative data, parcels, uh, boundaries of states, places where you um, divide up the plane using the lines. I'm not going to say anything more about that. It's complex. Uh, is, is post is fast? Yes, Postgres is faster than Oracle Spatial, it's faster than ArcGIS, and it's faster than SQL Server. It is also slower than all those. <laughs> it very much depends on the use case. Um, there's always someone who has a particular case which is faster or slower than any other product. Um, that said, I have never had someone come to me and say, oh, I went to Postgres and I'm so disappointed. It's pretty much always the other way. So I feel like our... Uh, Throw that gauntlet down. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> there it is. It is better. I don't feel bad saying about that because I've never had people come to me and say, oh, I tried to use it. You gave me this wonderful gave this wonderful talk, but it was just nonsense. I'm going back to Oracle. Doesn't matter. <laughs> um, to make things faster, the key to making things faster is making things smaller. Smallification is key, and we provide tools for smallification. Um, so ST subdivide will take a very large polygon and cut up into small bits. This is a 90,000 vertex uh, multi-polygon with SD subdivides. You can cut up into little squares, none of which has more than 250 vertices. That allows the indexes to work on your data better. It allows it to come off the disk faster. It's a great way to make queries quicker. Um, take complex things and make them simple. Simplification, we've got two algorithms for that. Classic Douglas, Douglas Poiker. Um, good for lines, less good for areas. Um, simplified VW, the vis -Valangam. I said it. The vis -Valangam <laughs> wide algorithm. Much better for areas, less good for lines. Um, another way to make your data faster is to stick it on the disk in more or less the same order it exists in the world. So ordering it by, in this case, a Morton key order. So the default order by for geometry is in fact a Morton key order. So it lays it down on the disk um, in such a way that it comes back off a lot faster for things like spatial queries. We've got some really cool, this is in recent versions, 2.4, 2.5 clustering algorithms now. Uh, cluster DB scan, that's a proximity based clustering algorithm. So you can specify how much proximity you want between the uh, elements of your clusters and then what your minimum cluster size. We also have the classic k-means clustering algorithms. Two fingers. She has two fingers. Uh, and there's even more advanced geospatial spatial processing functions. <laughs> yeah. No, not that. Yeah, we got, uh, we got Voronoi processing, Voronoi diagrams. We got DLNA triangulation. That's really complex and crazy. Who would ever use that for anything practical? The answer is really smart people. I'm just showing you what you can do when you have all these different functions available to you. 
we're going to solve this not easy but hard GIS problem using only the functions in postgres. So, given an arbitrary polygon, we want to divide it into sub polygons that are more or less the same size. What do we do? We start by filling the polygon with a uniform random set of points using the generate points function. Then we use the k-means clustering algorithm to cluster it into, in our, this case, nine different clusters. But of course, you can choose how many clusters you want. Just change k. Now, given those clusters, we've got, you can kind of see we've already subdivided it. We don't have lines yet. We need to make lines based on those clusters. How do we do that? Start by finding the center of mass of each cluster using the centroid function. Now, Delaunay, Voronoi polygons, voila. Not quite a subdivision of the original thing yet because those polygons go outside the boundaries. So what we need to do is clip them to the original with the ST intersection and voila, we have solved our not easy but hard GIS problem using only six PostGIS functions. You can do GIS without GIS. And when you do, you open up all kinds of possibilities for how you can build systems and solve problems. So two points to take away from this talk. First, geospatial <laughs> is a series <laughs> of tubes. <laughs> Transformations, information movement, and change. And second, PostGIS and Spatial SQL are great tools for building those tubes. If you really like PostGIS and you wish you could use it and your boss says you can't because support, please come to me, talk to me, talk to my wonderful friend Stephen Frost over there. Um, Crunchy Data knows all the magic required to run certified PostGIS. And even those demanding security and scalable environments like, say, the government. Thanks for your time and your attention. Uh, can we hear it for 2019? Yes. Thank you, Paul. A great year. Okay.